Among all the questions raised by the study of planet Venus, one is inescapable. Is our neighboring planet volcanically active? To answer this question, Eurovenus scientists are studying every possible clue using a wide range of tools on ground and in space. Venus is covered d'une couche de nuages extrêmement épaisse qui nous, nous empêche d'ailleurs d'observer sa surface euh, à l'œil nu. Et euh, par des observations répétées depuis, depuis maintenant des, presque des siècles, on sait que les molécules, ces nuages sont composés d'acide sulfurique, extrêmement peu sympathique donc pour aller y vivre. Cet acide sulfurique, il a été formé par combinaison de deux molécules essentiellement qui sont SO2, dioxyde de soufre, et vapeur d'eau H2O. Et c'est pourquoi nous avons euh, attaché donc toute notre attention à l'étude de ces deux molécules. Et pour ce faire, nous utilisons un spectromètre qui s'appelle TEXES, qui est monté à la, à, au télescope donc depuis une semaine maintenant. Alors je suis toujours sous le télescope et il est possible de voir Vénus en plein jour en prenant des repères sur le télescope qui permettent de s'aligner. Alors ici, je mets mon œil en face d'un premier repère qui est situé sur la partie proche de moi du télescope et j'aligne avec un second repère qui est au bout du télescope de l'autre côté. En alignant ces positions, je tombe sur Vénus et je le vois. Ah ben c'est très émouvant, c'est très émouvant. Il serait évidemment impossible de le voir de voir la planète s'il n'y avait pas ce dispositif, parce que la lumière de Vénus comparée à la lumière du ciel, évidemment, ne permet pas de la détecter sans un repère précis. Quand on a commencé à observer, c'était en 2012, ça fait donc exactement quatre ans maintenant, on observe, et c'était la première fois que des observations de ce type étaient faites, et on s'attendait un peu naïvement à ce que les, les observations des deux molécules suivent la même évolution temporelle et spatiale. En fait, ce n'est absolument pas le cas. Dès la première mission, on s'est rendu compte que les cartes de la vapeur d'eau sont relativement homogènes sur le disque et varient assez lentement dans le temps, alors qu'au contraire, le dioxyde de soufre a des, va des variations extrêmement fortes le long du, enfin, sur le disque de Vénus. Le problème, c'est qu'avec cette couche d'acide sulfurique qui est extrêmement épaisse, on ne sait pas, on n'arrive pas à savoir exactement ce qui se passe en, en dessous. L'origine de SO2, on pense que ça doit être du volcanisme. On sait qu'il y a eu du volcanisme sur Vénus dans le temps, parce qu'il y a eu des images radar, donc qui permettent de sonder au travers des nuages, qui ont montré que Vénus était couverte, la surface de Vénus est couverte de volcans. Mais ce qu'on n'arrive pas à savoir, et ce qu'on aimerait bien savoir, c'est si le volcanisme est encore actif aujourd'hui. Et si on arrivait à mettre en évidence euh, une, une très forte évolution du SO2, on pourrait vraiment essayer de corréler ça à un événement volcanique présent. La difficulté de relier ce qui se passe au niveau euh, des nuages à ce qui se passe à la surface de Vénus, c'est qu'il y a une pression à la surface de Vénus qui est à peu près 100 fois la pression atmosphérique terrestre. Autrement dit, s'il y a une plume volcanique qui est émise à la surface, elle va être écrasée par toute cette masse de gaz. On peut prendre comme équivalent ce qui se passe euh, sur la Terre en imaginant qu'il y ait une éruption au fond des océans, à côté d'Hawaï, ici, supposons qu'une nouvelle île soit formée, eh bien, on ne verra rien à la surface de l'eau. Eh bien, on est un petit peu, si vous voulez, dans cette situation-là. Observations that, uh, that are made uh, from the Earth can be used to localize um, plumes or regions where the concentrations are higher or lower, give a direct view of uh, what's happening at that moment of the observation. We have developed uh, another instrument, another kind of instrument, 
called uh, SWAR, Solar Occultation in the Infrared. And this is an instrument is on board Venus Express, the ESA mission around Venus. When an instrument is sent into space, a copy is always kept by the makers so that they can reproduce any problem that might happen during the mission and help fix it. The sun actually is there on your right, on my right. Uh, you have the light coming here, enters into the instrument. Right here, what you have is a filter, a custo optical filter, which allows us to select a uh, given wave, uh, wavelength region, uh, spectral region that we want to study. Then uh, you have some optics, the mirrors that reflect the light inside. And then, then here you have the most important part of the instrument, which is uh, an Escher grating. The Escher grating is quite an amazing uh, part of the instrument. Of the instrument, actually, it's the most expensive part because uh, here in what you see you have very very uh, thin uh, groves uh, you have actually four groves per millimeter that diffract the light and then send it back to the mirror and then here to the detector of the instrument the detector is cooled down to a temperature of uh, 170 uh, Kelvin uh, minus, LT, uh, minus uh, 100 degrees Celsius so the SWAR instrument actually was uh, sounding the atmosphere using solar occultation. So the solar occultation principle is quite uh, is a quite easy to understand. Actually, what we are looking at are sunsets and sunrise on the planet. So. Uh, what we do is that we point the instrument towards the sun while uh, the, the spacecraft is rotating around the orbit. We first take spectra of the sun while not looking through the atmosphere. And then at the moment, uh, the sun, as seen from the spacecraft, will set uh, on the planet. And we keep recording spectra and while looking through the atmospheres. And by dividing the spectra we take while looking through the atmosphere by the one we had before, crossing the atmosphere, we obtain spectra of the atmosphere only. And from these spectra, we can uh, study the composition of the planet. What we can say is that uh, both species are very, very variable in terms of time, short-term times, and uh, um, in terms of altitudes, for example, for the SO2, um, our observations seems to indicate that there is a a source of sulfur higher in the atmosphere. It's highly improbable that there could be a, a source of sulfur so high in the atmosphere. So the volcanic uh, activity could explain what we are observing uh, concerning the um, SO2 abundance. Scientists proceed cautiously. These variations in SO2 abundance are not necessarily caused by active volcanism because of complex chemical cycles in the clouds. However, measurements of SO2 from another instrument aboard Venus Express showed a striking pattern. Those observations are very interesting because they show that at the beginning of the mission, uh, right at the start, there, were, uh, there was a, a, a large increase in the SO2 abundance observed and which decreased uh, during the, the mission. And similar observations had been done for, in the past by other missions who saw the same behavior, a large peak of SO2 abundance and then decrease. And one of the explanations, of course, could be volcanic activity. You could imagine that uh, there would be a Vulcan expelling SO2. You have your peak and then decrease while uh, SO2 is mixed in the atmosphere. That's one of the explanations which could be uh, possible. It's great walking around on the surface of these lavas because you get a sense of what it might be like walking around on Venus. Except, of course, for the temperature on Venus. Remember, the surface temperature is 450 degrees, so we wouldn't last long. When the Soviet landers first arrived at the surface of Venus, they started taking some pictures. This is back in the 70s and, and early 80s, and they revealed uh, some black rocks everywhere, what seemed to be things very much like these lavas, uh, which made people think that there could be lots of volcanic activity. 
And that suspicion was confirmed when the Magellan radar mapper arrived in, in the 90s and, uh, and revealed that yes, there were indeed volcanoes all over the surface of Venus. But although we know that there are things shaped like volcanoes all, all over the surface of Venus, we don't know if they're active. Uh, and so that remains one of the most important questions today is, is our neighboring planet geologically alive or dead? Um, so with Venus Express, we've had a few interesting uh, hints about this. One thing you can do is you can look for how black the lava is. So a lava like this, this is really recent in geological terms. It's very black. Over time, it'll, it'll change color. It'll get less black. And so on Venus Express, we've seen that the blackest areas of the surface are right next to some particular volcanoes in spots where we think uh, there's likely to be volcanic activity. So that's a hint at geologically recent volcanism. Another thing we can do from orbit is map the surface temperature uh, because if the planet's geologically dead, you'd expect everything to be roughly the same temperature, or maybe the highlands are colder than the lowlands, as you find on Earth. But if activity is going on today, if volcanoes are active today, we might see lava lakes, we might see hot gases emitted from a vent and things. And uh, so Venus Express was not designed to do this. It can only do it at some very particular times in its orbit and it didn't get lots of information about this, but there are some images where uh, we do see hot points arising on the surface and then cooling off again. So that might be the smoking gun, that might be volcanism in action, uh, but it'll take future missions to really answer this question. Imagine a planet covered with active volcanoes, lava flows, and plumes of volcanic gases Recent observations show that this is increasingly likely to be the reality of our neighboring planet, Venus.